we'll be surveying the book of Habakkuk. Uh, unlike the previous two books, there really is very that this book is famous for. Um, hymns, so we sang one of them today, right, have been made out of chapter 2, verse uh, 14 and verse 20. But other than that, I'm not aware of anything else that makes this book famous. Uh, if you are, please share with me. Now, as such, it might not be a surprise that many of us have not read this book, or at least not in a while. So let's have a little background on the book of Habakkuk. It was written by Habakkuk in the late 7th century BC. Israel, the northern kingdom, had fallen by then, and Judah uh, was a vassal state of the Assyrians. Most of their kings worshipped idols, although in their midst there was King Josiah, right, who feared God, and did reform the land a little bit. History was about to turn its tide again at the time of Habakkuk. Uh, the Assyrians were weakening and losing ground constantly to Babylon as Nineveh was already destroyed, and soon with the entire Assyrian Empire. Before then, the Assyrians had been a constant threat to the Hebrews for over 200 years, and yet their destruction was no cause for celebration for Habakkuk, because he knew that after the Assyrians, the Babylonians would move on to destroy Judah as well. Habakkuk saw that things was about to go from bad to worse, and this book as his plea as well as God's response. It's a short book, just three chapters, uh, and the structure is as follows. Chapter 1, uh, verse 2 to 11, uh, was Habakkuk's first plea and God's response. Chapter 1, verse 12, to chapter 2, verse 20, uh, is Habakkuk's lament and God's response. And then chapter 3, verses 1 to 19, is Habakkuk's closing prayer. Notwithstanding that the big difference in length, Habakkuk is actually quite similar to the book of Job. And given the difference in length, right, we could consider this as a Job light, if you want. Both Job and Habakkuk encountered great difficulty, and they presented their case before God. God, rather than responding directly to the case, told Job or Habakkuk a little bit about himself and his plan. And having heard that, both Job and Habakkuk went on their knees and trusted God more than before. Even though, strictly speaking, neither of their cases were dealt with by God. So no matter if it's Job, Habakkuk, or us, we can learn more about God even when he doesn't seem to answer our question. Because there is one way, that's one way we learn to trust him. And trust is the theme of our survey today. Since it's quite a short book, uh, we can cover a bit of the actual text. Let's begin with Habakkuk's first plea, from chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed. And justice never prevails. The wicked helm in the righteous so that justice is perverted. This was Habakkuk's plea over Judah. For the kings were wicked and the people were oppressed. Oppression aside, the people were also wicked and very few of them feared God. Habakkuk was pleading for his people from imminent threat. And he was pleading to his holy God. And although he loved and cared about them, he also knew that they might not be all that deserving of God's mercy, given their own rebelliousness. How to pray for the unrighteous is a challenge, both for Habakkuk then and for us now. 
We'll come back to this at the end of the message. Given Habakkuk's state at the time of his plea, God's response must have felt like salt on a very bad wound. Because not only did God foretold the coming invasion of the Babylonians, but how also how gruesome that invasion would be. If we were Habakkuk, how would we handle such an answer? Or, if we have never received such an answer, what might that suggest about our prayer life? Now it could be that God has only given us gentle answers. It's possible, and that would be great. But it also could be that we haven't prayed enough. So we wouldn't notice any answers one way or the other. Now no matter, don't be surprised if God gives us a difficult answer. It wouldn't be the first time, right, as we shall see in Habakkuk. And this is what God told Habakkuk in chapter 1, verse 6 to 11. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people, who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. They all come intent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all the fortified cities. By building earthen ramps, they capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on. Guilty people whose strength is their God. This is one scary answer to prayer. Habakkuk prayed for relief, and God told him more death and destruction was to come. How could God say that? How would we handle such an answer to our prayers? Before going further, I'd like to explore Habakkuk's role in this. We need to be clear about this for the sake of interpretation and application. Habakkuk was a prophet, but not in the typical sense. Famous prophets that we all know and are familiar with would be ones like Samuel or Jeremiah. Samuel was a judge and prophet. So he was a leader and then he was a counselor to the kings. He had both an anointing from God and real political power. Jeremiah was a prophet too. Unlike Samuel, he was rejected by the kings, but at least he had access to them. Right? So in other words, he had an anointing from God and some political influence. And we tend to treat these prophets as norm, as in their words, had a big audience and could change events if only his audience would listen to them. Habakkuk wasn't like that at all. It's not clear if he had any audience at all. And if he did, it might not even have been his calling to use his prophecy to change them. Quite unlike other prophets that we tend to think of. God gave Habakkuk a vision, an almost private prophecy, seemingly just for historical record. And besides that, perhaps only to change Habakkuk. Have we considered that possibility in our lives? Some of us have had visions, some in the real spiritual sense, and others through circumstances or an inner voice. Regardless, it tends to refer to something outwards, someone, a group of people, even a community. And more often than not, it's about something we do with them or for them, serve them, share the gospel with them, show them other forms of Christian love in action. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. That just might be what God has in mind. From Habakkuk, we become aware of another way God works. Yes, the vision might be real, and the substance of the vision might indeed be fulfilled. Yet God's focus isn't what would happen. That's his business, so to speak. Our part, even though we are made aware of the events, is only, even though we're made aware of what's going to happen, our part is only to change ourselves inwardly. Have you ever had such a vision? 
Now, putting aside personal visions, which differs from individual to individual, let's consider our common vision. We all have these two visions. One, Jesus is coming back. And two, when he does, he will judge both the living and the dead. How has these two visions changed us? Now, for sure, they have led us to do different things. But have they also led us to become a different person? As we consider that, let's see how Habakkuk's vision affected him. At first, Habakkuk did not like God's response at all. Right? We read that. He said in verse, chapter 1, verse uh, 13, and then chapter 2, verse 1, Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up these, those more righteous than themselves? I will stand by at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answers I am to give to this complaint. Habakkuk basically said, God, you might be pure and holy, but your priority is wrong. Using the Babylonians is not the appropriate way to judge us, even though we deserve some punishment. He told God, your priority is wrong. Habakkuk's response is quite common. I've done it lots of times. In Habakkuk's mind, God should have done this, done that, do this, do that, and God didn't, right? He complained. He basically asked God to go back to doing what Habakkuk considered as right and proper. Habakkuk told God, you should do what I think is right and proper. It might sound bad when Habakkuk is doing it, right? Telling God what to do. Have we not done the same? I mean, as I prepare this message, I reflected on all the prayers I lifted up for Dan. It's always been to ask God to help him do this, help him do that, help me and you do this and that for him. Once or twice, I might have prayed for God's illumination, but mostly it's been about all the needs that I saw and how God to respond to those needs. Right? We all know that prayers cannot be just me, me, and me. But guess what? I'm sure Habakkuk knew that too. And yet, when he was under duress, that's how he prayed. And that's how I pray. So obviously, Habakkuk had missed God's point. God wasn't using Habakkuk's prophecy to reshape history. He only wanted to use his prophecy to reveal history and to teach Habakkuk about trusting him. And no matter if it's Habakkuk or us, learning to trust God more begins with knowing him better. Same God, same God, even the same attributes, yet we desperately need to know him better. To help Habakkuk know him better, God gave him a lengthy reply in chapter 2. It's a bit longer, so I'll break it down in sections. Chapter 2, verse 2 to 3, God told Habakkuk to write down what God said. Verses 4 to 5, God reconfirmed that the Babylonians would attack as foretold. Verses 6 to 19, God counted the past and future sins of Babylon and then verse 20, God reminded Habakkuk that he is God. So in short, God said three things. One, write them down. Two, I will do what I have already told you. And three, I know right and wrong better than anyone because I'm God. Now, it's obvious that that I am God statement is very powerful and it changed Habakkuk. But before going there, I want to touch on the previous two points. Writing God down God's word and recalling what he has told us. The first point is obvious. You know, we're reading Habakkuk today because Habakkuk obeyed and wrote down God's words. Obeying is a good start as we learn to trust God more. 
There is no such thing as trust without obedience. If we say we trust God, we better obey Him. Now, as for God doing what He has already told, this is the answer to our earlier question. What are we doing about Jesus' return and His impending judgment on the living or the dead? If, if, like Habakkuk, these two visions are meant to change us, how have they? If, like Habakkuk, these two visions are meant to make us trust God more, how have they? We can draw a reference from Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 to 10. The Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Paul and Timothy, they went to Thessalonica. They got such a hostile and bad reception that they were quickly kicked out, and yet God, in his divine favor, enabled a church to be planted. And the Thessalonian church became a faithful church. How did they transform? The verses tell us. They were transformed by trusting in the return of Jesus. Trusting in Jesus' return isn't some church jargon that we use without meaning it. It's meant to be true, real, and transforming. More generally still, growing in our trust of God is transforming. No sooner than he heard God's reply, Habakkuk began to change. I encourage you to read Habakkuk chapter 3. Imagine someone who just had a vision with gruesome details on the enemy's invasion. He was frightful of the event and angry at God for planning it. How could that person then turn around and praise God over his creation, his splendor, and his rule over human history? It had to be a very dramatic change. And Habakkuk said it himself in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 16. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet, I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will be joyful in God my Savior." Habakkuk changed because he had learned a lesson. And the lesson, like many in the Bible, is easy to understand, but much harder to practice. And the lesson is simply that when God has made up his mind, we cannot do better than simply to trust him. When God has made up his mind, we cannot do anything better than to simply trust him. As God said in chapter 2, verse 20, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. We must focus away from ourselves and trust God. And trust means at least two things. The first is accept, and the second is change, and a possible third is act. Accept is self-evident. We cannot trust in anything we don't accept. And in Habakkuk's case, we see that change. He went from questioning God's decision to use the Babylonians to realizing that when God sets forth his plans, they are the right plans.
It's not a begrudging kind of acceptance, you know, like Dan accepting that he has to practice the piano, but an acceptance out of reverence and awe, like Habakkuk here. Change must follow acceptance. Habakkuk changed dramatically, so it's easy to notice. Other forms of change might be more subtle or take longer, and regardless of time, change is necessary. That's why we must reflect on the earlier question. Are there things in our lives that we would only do because we trust in Jesus' return? Put another way, we should have a list of things that we absolutely would not bother with if not for our trust in Jesus' return. What's on our list? And that takes us back to the first question. How do, how, and to what extent do we plead the course of the unrighteous? Or simpler still, how are we to pray for our neighbors? Now we asked this question earlier because that's how Habakkuk got into his debate with God. He prayed for Judah only for God to tell him that God would send Babylon to destroy Judah. So what about us? How are we to pray for our generation, which like any generation, is wicked? Let's see if we can learn this from Habakkuk as our final lesson for today. In the midst of Habakkuk's prayer, he remembered this in chapter, uh, chapter 3 verse 13. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. Habakkuk's prayer for the people of Judah was not based on their righteousness, but God's faithfulness. God had promised Abraham God had promised David, so Habakkuk prayed for his people on the basis that God will keep his promises to Abraham and David. What about us? Now we don't plead to God on the basis of Abraham and David because those promises have been fulfilled on the work of Jesus on the cross. So we plead in Jesus' name instead. How would Jesus pray for our generation? How did Jesus pray for his generation? Or more specifically, how did Jesus teach his followers about praying for their generation? In Luke chapter 10, verse 2 and 3, we read, He told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Jesus taught his followers to pray for more workers and pray that we would be sent as lambs among wolves. Wow, lambs among wolves. That's a lot like Judah versus Babylon, isn't it? But there's more to this prayer. Recalling that Habakkuk had to accept and change, this prayer is our call to accept and change. Do we trust Jesus enough to believe that this prayer, just pray for more workers, despite our own clear inadequacies? We just lambs. The world is full of wolves. Is God's perfect plan for our generation? Now this verse really is a double-edged sword. It teaches us how to pray for our generation and it challenges us on just how much we trust Jesus. First, the prayer. We pray that the church would send out workers, ourselves included. Our focus is not on the wickedness of the world. Maybe not even their needs but the work of the church. Jesus said, first and foremost, pray that there'll be workers and they'll be ready. So don't treat this as a special verse for missionaries. This is a verse for the whole church. Many of us have heard this verse tens, if not hundreds of times. 
how many times have we prayed for workers to be sent? Is it in our daily prayer? If not, why not? Just ask ourselves, how serious do we think Jesus was when he said this? Was he being casual? Just an off-cuff remark? Or was it a lot more than that? So let me end with something a little bit more provocative. Many of you have shared with me in private or in small groups that you really care about our generation. The situation is, is grave indeed. Our world is increasingly secular. The church is not even a fraction of the population and faces persecution no matter if they're in the so-called free world or not. In some parts of the world, Christians are locked up in the name of fundamentalism. In other parts of the world, they are shut up in the name of pluralism. In such an environment, do we trust Jesus enough? Do we trust Jesus enough to believe that praying for more workers is the best response? We could have an answer by reviewing our own prayers. Do we trust Jesus? So having come full circle on Habakkuk, learning to trust God more even though we are weak and our generation is wicked. We just have this one simple application. If we are serious about trusting God more, let's start by praying for more workers to be sent. Pray daily because this is a powerful prayer. See if we can go on for a month praying this daily. And we could see if we can go on for a year. God doesn't always answer our questions about our generation. But he does expect us to pray for more workers to be sent. That's how we show our trust in him. And if we accept, we will change. Next time, we will look at the book of Zephaniah. Again, there's only three chapters, so please read it more than once if you can. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for being a God who, who wants to change us. And Father, we pray that you will change us into the likeness of Jesus, starting by praying for more workers to be sent. And Lord, if it is right, send us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.